All right, folks, welcome to the Winter Folsom podcast, your source for battle-tested leadership and resiliency. And we have an epic guest and an epic mm -hmm. show uh, for everyone today. Want to give us a lowdown, Josh? Yeah, we're here with Scott Kellogg, who has been in our K4 men's work community and uh, has he's really doing some profound work around transformational chair work, which we won't go deep into that necessarily today, but we're going to talk about some of the concepts that he's brought to our community that are both therapeutic, coaching, men's work related. Like it, it'll traverse so many areas and anybody listening, you're going to have big wake ups today when we start to talk about some of these concepts, because they're all parts of yourself and they're aspects of yourself. And uh, it's been really helpful for all of us in the community. And we're excited to share some of that with you. So, mm. and Hey, for me, um, Dr. Scott Kellogg, I, I got, I've had some kind of personal good shifts from you because I, I had never really acknowledged the term inner critic. Obviously, it, we all know it's there, but to have some sort of an authoritative person say, yeah, you, you have this dragon being in you that served a purpose and now maybe just sort of self-sabotage. That, that was a big topic for myself and for a lot of the K4 men's community. And so why don't we hear a little bit about kind of who you are real quick, your background, and then let's get into that so we can do, get the work out there. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's really a privilege to be here. I mean, I'm, you guys are both heroes to me, so it means a lot to be able to spend some time with you like this. So I'm a clinical psychologist. I began my journey in 1985, started working in the addiction world in 1988, but I discovered chair work in 2001 and I fell in love with it. And this becomes this complete sort of revolution in my life. And a core part of that is seeing people as having different parts. And basically there are kind of three aspects. One is working with our parts. One is working with what I would call stories, but really it's memories, it's traumatic memories from the past. I use stories a little bit differently than sometimes the K4 people use the word stories. And the third was our relationships. So these are kind of our three dimensions that we're gonna work with and and jerk, you know, is extremely powerful emotional technique. One thing I was thinking of a little bit, just a little history moment, is you know, you know, if we if we go back to Esalen in the like 1960s and 1970s, you know, what are some of the things we see? We see the introduction of yoga. We see the introduction of meditation. We see martial arts. We see Joseph Campbell talking about the hero's journey there, and we see chair work, and we see psychedelics, right? So many of these things that are in our community and in the culture, but chair work is right there with the hero's journey. So it's interesting how you know we have kind of a root um, or an origin story from your work and my work that kind of you know has a common common source. Hmm. So the inner critic, and I've been sort of an hey, Scott. Why is it called? Just let, let everybody know what chair work. Why is it called chair work? So. In, if those of you have been into more traditional therapy, if someone says, well, I have this issue with my father, you know, he's, he's a very complicated man, you know, well, talk to me, tell me about your father, you know, well, I, I, you know, he could be really great, but then when he got drunk, he was like a fucking disaster. I should stop the swearing on a, on a podcast. Fuck uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, and we talk I'll, about- I was welcome. Yeah, you know, we talk about the father, but with chair work, we can go, well, you know, Actually, let's imagine your father's here. Let's put him in this, just talk to him directly, right? Mm. And tell him, dad, it was complicated with you. It was, it was complicated with you, you know, and that, you know, really ups the emotion. And a more advanced technique would be, let's get two chairs. Dad, you know, this was the father I loved. This was the father, you know, who was so great. And this was the father who was a nightmare. And I can begin to separate out the good father and the just troubled father, right? And that's often, if you grew up in alcoholic or dysfunctional families, you often have this kind of split memory. Another another version, you know, it's, some men may have of, you know, I've seen this, you know, when I was growing up, my father was an alcoholic. He was drinking all the time or he had some gambling problem or something, right? But then he got, he got sober, he got into recovery. And now he's been, you know, in recovery for 20 years and now he's my best friend. So I have these two different fathers, you know, a current one and a historical one, and that creates complicated emotions, right? Mm -hmm. Again, we can spoke, we we talk to them as if they're here rather than just talking about them. Fritz the Pearls, Fritz Pearls, a great chair, had a great phrase. He said, "When you're talking about some somebody, it's called gossiping." <laughs> mm -hmm. We don't do gossip in therapy. We talk to the people who are having trouble with. Mm -hmm. 
just one thing. I, I actually took uh, a transformational chair work um, course. And um, one thing I got from that course in a breakout session is you can also talk to the parts of yourself. Mm-hmm. And I'd never given my inner critic a voice. And I didn't even think I had negative self-talk until I did his <laughs> workshop. And then because I could never hear any, like people would say, what are the negatives? And I was like, I don't hear anything. And then I did this transformational chair work. There was literally a part of me that came out that was angry and was like, just beating up. And I was like, Oh, there's this dude. And he was like a hardcore, like uh, highly critical. And so I was like, so very transformational experience when you give it a voice for those that maybe struggle hearing things or like you have dissociated memories from childhood or whatever else it is, it can be a really profound way to play, like to play with this and to give it a voice. So it's not just people, but parts of self super potent as well. And, and we don't, we don't recognize that inner voice because it is us at that point. Is almost a possession, hmm. right? The the liar. I mean, how I went through a list of the thing, of things that I am lying to myself. Who's who's the one lie? Who's lying? And who's the who are they lying? Who's he lying to? That was a weird. That was a strange splitting kind of an experience. Hmm. So really powerful, um, Scott. Thank you. So uh, there was this this couple they developed from Louisiana named the Elliots, and they developed a, a therapy around the inner critic with chairs. And they said, in a quote I like, they said, 99% of all forms of mental illness and suffering are, are based in the inner critic, right? This is the heart of all the suffering. I would say inner critic and trauma are the two which overlap, but are two things. So can what you is that the, one more? Can you say that one more time just so everybody really gets that? Like, that's a big stat. Can you say that one I more see, time? Did, I mean, it's a metaphorical stat, but it's huh. a it just make the point. But they're saying, you know, ninety nine percent of addictions, personality disorder, depression, OCD, you know, all the things we're suffering with are rooted in inner critic voices or responses to you know, to inner critic voices. OCD is attempt to avoid the inner critic, right? Depression is getting bombarded by the inner critic. You know, rage may be another way to to you know get away from the pain of, of that experience. Narcissism, right? Um, and the other is trauma. All right, thank you, Scott Kellogg. Thank you very much. Yeah. We're done. Okay, good. <laughs> I, I have to digest that for like an hour now. So thank yeah, you very much. That, that Great to see like you a again. <laughs> sledgehammer. Everybody can now like sit with that and replay that and just sledgehammer. <laughs> so, so the problem with men, I think, in men's work, if I may say this, and maybe I'm, you can, you're the experts, is that men certainly talk about trauma, but they tend to think the inner critic is good. They tend to identify with the inner critic or see that beating myself up is, well, that's kind of like a useful thing to do or, you know. So, so this is kind of my thing with the inner critic that I'm, I've kind of been promoting in recent years. Um, there's a lot of attention now being paid to the inner critic. We're seeing more and more just on, you Google it, you'll see it on, you know, all over um, the internet now. But there are really two different kinds of inner critics. And I think this is a very important distinction to make. And you were making reference to one of them, Philip. Um, the very classic inner critic, and this gets us back to Freud, was um, the idea that we, we get messages from our parents, we get messages from the environment that we basically come inside of us and they live inside of us. And especially in the case of trauma or abuse or mistreatment, you know, it's like people can say, you know, I hear my mother's voice. I hear my father's voice. I hear that fucking abuser. I can, I can always feel his or her presence in my being, right? And people will say that. It's like, you know, I think of it more, it's what they call an interject technically. It's like another entity is living inside of you, just blasting you, right? And these can be very, very serious. They can lead to suicide. They can lead to horrendous things. And that was the kind of classic, you know, model and obviously you know, rooted in trauma. But it's like this force is living inside of us. But what I've come to studying the teacher is what I've come to realize in more recent years is in fact, most people's inner critic is actually a protector mode, which means it's a, it's a mode that develops around, I think people saying six or seven, maybe five or four. Basically they're saying, I'm here to keep you safe. And I'm learning ways for you, you know, strategies for us to be safe. So um, if you do these things, we should be safe. And, and perhaps that actually was working when we were a child or when we were young or something. In that environment, these rules made sense. But they become very problematic as we become adults. Right? And um, they lead to all kinds of troubles. 
So some of you may know IFS, which is very popular right now. And there's a book, uh, Dick Schwartz has put a book called No Bad Parts. Mm. I don't think he's completely correct. I think, you know, I think it's mostly, it's mostly good parts and some bad parts. And that's kind of, I think, the reality. You know, it's probably like 80%. These are parts that are trying to help the person. 8% of the patients, it's helping them. 20% of the patients, it's actually an abuser. So the first thing we need to do as a therapist is I, I, and I often talk to, I put them in a chair and I talk to this critic. And I say, you know, why, why are you telling Philip to work so hard? Or why are you telling Josh to keep going to the gym? You know, sorry. Um, you know, what's, what's the deal? Why is it so important? You know, why, you know, why do this? And they will usually give me some like social reason, which I don't accept. I said, no, but why are you as a person, why are you telling this man what to do specifically? And you push that hard enough, you get to the reasons. And for the coping modes, they're usually quite frightened. You know, if you, if they don't do this, they'll get they'll they'll become homeless. That something bad will happen, right? But if it's a critic, they go, you know, I just hate him, and he's ugly, and he's stupid, and he's a waste, and you, you can hear the voice, and that's your core differential diagnosis, right? And for the critics, and most of the critics again are coping modes. We now need to, a new relationship with this part, right? It's like you're not because they're not going anywhere. It's like okay, you know. This worked when I was, you know, 10. It doesn't work at 35. So how are we going to work together? How can we use your skills, whatever of observation or your, your sense of standards? Um, but also is the other part is inner leader. We'll talk about that probably later. Is that it's my life, it's not your life, and I do not work for you. You are a part, you are a imagine, you know, you're part of my mind. You're not a real person. I'm not here to serve you. We'll get to that a little bit later. But you know, I mean, it's my life, you know. But if it's a abuser, if it's if it's a father that's that was abusive, that part needs. I need not to listen to that part. That is not a place of wisdom. That is not a part that's on my side. And that's hard for people to accept that. That's a journey. You go. This is this does not have my my best wishes. What it's saying is not true, right? And it comes from a place of, I would say, basically. Yeah, I was gonna. This is a big question. Uh, yeah, one, one, I was just going to give it a different context, but the same same general thing. One of the ways I frame it a metaphor, because I do a lot of very similar parts work, and I just love this conversation, Scott. And um, one way I frame it is imagine we're these little kids, innocent kids that see the world as beautiful, and then something happens to hurt us. And it's so painful. Usually it's a form of abandonment or feeling not loved or not enough. It's some core level when you track, when I've tracked it back. And in that moment, it's so painful that this part, comes online to protect us as you're describing. And so the way, one of the ways I, I use the metaphor is imagine you're a little kid and people are hurting you. And so all of a sudden a dog emerges like a rabid dog. That's a very protective dog. And he starts to like, or a dragon your, or a dragon. There we go. A dragon comes to like, take everybody's heads off, but the dragon could, instead of taking people's heads off, like a fight mode, it could also get scared in the corner and play really small, like a little chihuahua in the corner. Like it has all these different identities that it can show up as in order to get you through the through that painful experience and when it does it now feels like it's it's, it's your protector because the child can't defend itself so then as an adult imagine then you're just opening the door and family friends loved one kiddos all these things are coming in the house and this dragon is either attacking or going in the corner and shaking the same protective parts are coming online but as an adult you're like this isn't what i want so it's it's the recognition of like this is what's happening. And one other piece is I do find when people do become aware of it, and we talk about this in K4, they usually try to fight it or kill it off. And that's where you're at a end roads is you're stuck trying to fight or kill a part of you you can't kill. Uh, so I'm curious your thoughts on that a little bit deeper around, you know, when they're in shadow integration. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the, the three core strategies are one is just to be completely subservient, right? Just to, to sort of give in, you know, have no will, do what people say, be very be sort of passive. You know, that's one strategy. Um, you know, another one is to work on self-soothing, zoning out. This would be things like, you know, drugs, alcohol, food, porn, all the addictive self-soothing, workaholism, um, you know, these kinds of things to change the way we feel. Another one is to kind of go, I'm going to be aggressive. No one's going to mess with me. Narcissism, these kinds of things of like claiming a power against against a deep pain you know um these are kind of the, the standard coping mechanisms 
and strategies. You know, perfectionism, I'll be the best student that, you know, ever, ever lived, right? So, you know. So is I that the, o, the, OC, the OCD that is trying to avoid the inner critic? That's the best student version? Um, perfectionism probably be the best student, you know, just because, it, you know, shame or whatever it is, or, or you know, my, my survival, or I got a message, you know, from my family, or I found like, if I do this, I'll be loved, you know, in some families, like, if you do well, you get praised. If you don't do well, you get blasted, you're stupid. Hmm. So, uh, you know, it's some kind of coping mode. Um, there was a, one of the questions from one of the men watching, uh, and you mentioned earlier, um, you said OCD is a, a means of avoiding the inner critic. And then you said a couple other um, what you would call mental health challenges, whether depression or addiction or, or anxiety. Those are all ways of dealing with the inner critic. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. C can you can you um, walk down a couple of those for the listeners? Because that was that was really powerful and actionable. This this famous analyst who worked with uh, addiction said, you know, that addiction is often a rebellion against the inner critic. You know, we're using drugs and alcohol to get an escape from this oppressive voice within us. You know, and we get some sort of freedom, but then that doesn't work, and then we come back and we get shamed even more, more of a loser, more of a failure. And we're feeling terrible. Then we go get high again or eat, eat the food. And we go through these cycles of being attacked, you know, and being ashamed and, and escaping, et cetera, et cetera. Um, OCD essentially is, is kind of a, you know, it's, um, I will do things to avoid something bad happening, you know, sort of, um, you know, and a lot of fear and often fear is connected to trauma or inner critic issues. You know, this, this, this bad thing could happen. Don't let it happen. This kind of very frightened voice. So I have to wash my hands or keep turning the lights on and off. Or I develop these rituals, you know, around that. Personality disorders often, you know, the, the inner leader is not strong, is not strong enough. So they develop these coping modes that are kind of very problematic with other people, you know, um, you know, uh, needing a lot of attention or um, avoiding people completely, you know, different strategies, schizoid versus, you know, maybe more uh, borderline in some ways. So there are all these kind of strategies that people figure out, but the answer is the development of the inner leader, right? And that's, that's what the psychotherapy is about. Um, and that in your, in our language at K4 would be that's the king of the four houses and not the king in the four houses. Um, you know, and that's, uh, and that's what therapy is about is creating a part that can say, wait a minute, this is my life and this part needs to get stronger and I get as a counter to the critic and, and it's something to regulate that these coping modes are not working anymore. I love, I just love this whole conversation in general, because this parts work is really aligning the aspects of yourself and giving permission to your inner leader to come online. Um, it's such a game changer because when you realize you have all these parts in yourself, instead of just thinking me, you actually start to learn like, oh, who's actually speaking right now? So if this part of me comes online and it's the it's a, an addiction behavior or it's an inner critic beating me up or it's something, you have permission to stop, regulate if you're by yourself and actually bring on or talk to that other part of yourself as you develop that inner leader um, to come online and make decisions for you and actually lead. And, and, and I think it's a big part of even what we're doing in K4 is we're identifying the adolescent parts of self, which are running rampant. And we're, we're giving permission for this inner leader to come online in a map of how to step into that inner leader in different aspects to go claim your life, to become free instead of staying stuck in a victim story or codependent, you know, vic villain, victim, savior, or codependency. We're really saying, nope. That's my inner critic that's kept me looping this because I'm afraid to go after what I want or I'm scared or all these other reasons. Instead, I'm going to go step into my inner leader and go claim it, right? Very different um, conversation. So it's super powerful. Can you talk a little bit more about this inner leader? Right. So, so uh, this is what Freud called the ego, which unfortunately, as Philip and I have talked about a little bit, has just been so misunderstood. and. Um, you know, and I and it, it's been character assassinated, maligned. It's character assassinated. Yeah, you know, it's I, it might have been Jung's fault doing this, but you know, it's like um, I think the spiritual world has not understood. They've confused the, the ego with the id, the ego with narcissism. They and they blasted it to death, 
And when in fact the goal of psychotherapy and the goal really of, of what we're doing is we're trying to strengthen the ego. But the word ego is like, can't be used anymore. So um, I use inner leader, I also use healthy adult mode in schema therapy. But it's basically the part of you that is, you know, we call it the heroic self, right? So this is the part that is involved in, in, in learning how to regulate the self, regulate our internal world, and engage in the world in a way that's meaningful, effective, you know, with good relationships that can, can claim a vision for ourselves, can persevere and take action, right? Um, this is this is the hero and the hero's journey is learning these these tools, these kinds of things. You know, there, I mean, we're, I'm talking psychopathology, you're talking kind of personal growth, so there's slight language difference, but you can see parallels here. Um, and you know, for most most of us, and for some patients, their their inner leaders are really completely undeveloped. I mean, they're they're almost non-existent, and their life is very turbulent because they have no ability to control. Relationships are, are a mess. Most of us, I would say, K four, myself included, you know, we're we're unevenly developed. We've got skills in some places we can be very very strong. Others, we're like, I don't know, that's frightening to me. You know. Um, and some people were pretty good, but the world is, you know, stress of the world is overwhelming us. You know, we're in crisis, you know, the, you know, but therapy in part, because there's a relationship between the, the patient and the therapist that helps to nurture, we're trying to nurture that, that inner leader, trying to nurture that ego. But, um, you know, so when people say, you know, spiritual people say their problem is the ego, I'm like, I'm gonna pull my hair out. It's like, you know, you know what is a good man? I, I hear I'm influenced by Dr. Harry Anderson Fosdick. You know, a good man, among other things, is a man of character. And a man of character means, and both of you are great examples of this. You know, when you say something, Joshua, you say you're going to do something. I know you're going to do it. I know you will see it through, right? I can have faith. I can trust you guys to do what you say. What you commit to do, you commit from your heart. I know you guys will do it, right? And many men in our community are like that. That's the ego. Ego is I stay I stay the course. That is what we're trying to. That's what a good part of what a good man is, right? Yeah, efficacy, perseverance, and I, I I will I will see the commitment through. I will see it through to the end, right? And but it's, it's but it's a it's a again it's a tricky landscape because also with that there can be some of these old defined roles of um, masculinity that are actually the inner critic. And it's actually right. feels like, for example, a adolescent, in, adolescent ad masculinity. Yeah, it's like right. adolescent past. Maybe this is a good way to tie the two together. Passed down from father's inadequacies or feelings of not enough. We take on those same inadequacies or loop those same stories or you called them um, memories, traumatic memories and stories of what we were told. And then we embody those. Right. And then oh. we're now listening to those and replaying. That's the stigma and all of police, fire, first responders, a military, they don't have any emotional tools because that's stigma because they were told it's inner critic, right? It's a, so I think these conversations can be, they're framed in the course of battle to be heroic, but without teaching them tools to come home to their family, to me, they're, it's incompetency, right? So it's a very much a missed, one thing can be strong in one area, but weak in the other uh, in this conversation. Well, let me, let me, so the inner leader chooses his or her values. We choose our values. That's part of being an inner leader. We don't do things because we should. Mm. Should is an inner critic, right? It's, it's I decide, I will, I choose, I say yes, I say no, which is very, very disturbing, very frightening thing to do, to be honest. So you, so example I like, so I look at some of my heroes. I look at like, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, we look at Nelson Mandela, we look at um, Dr. Albert Schweitzer, if you know who he is, we look at Theodore Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt. These were men who did the terrifying work of saying, what are the values in front of me? What are the values that I am choosing? And what is the life I'm going to live based on my values, right? This is not the same as, as a should or voices from the past. This is a conscious event expiration of who you are and a commitment to live your life that way. That's authentic, existential, heroic living. That's the inner leader. Okay. So that, you know, so um, 
Now, people may get traumatized on that journey. Maybe that's an overlap and, and people do get traumatized on their journeys, but they are self-chosen journeys or self-chosen ways of being in the world. They're not, you know, now you may have voices from your father or values from your parents that are in your mind, but the inner leader says, I will look at these and decide whether I will accept them as my own or not. They're not should voices, should values, they're chosen, and I will decide how I will live them. Not all the voices are, are bad per se. Some of them may have actually very good values, but most of us run on automatic pilot. We kind of just let our values be there. We're not, we're afraid to do this work because the work is very scary, but that's the work of the, of the, of the you know, mature existential adult, but is to say, who will I be? Who do I want to be? What is the story I'm creating going forward? So that's, you know, it's a scary thing, but it's a deep thing. And that's what heroic living is, in my opinion. <laughs> and, um, you know, we, we talked about, you know, the, the sort of four heroic uh, existential journeys. I mean, when, you, when Jack Donovan was on, I think we, we had a conversation, you know, and basically he said, you know, he felt that something was, was endangered. And he said, I'm choosing to save something that I, I love. And you guys have both said something's in danger. There's something I love so, and I'm choosing it. And that's an inner leader decision. Jack Donovan said something beautiful is dying. Right. And Masculinity. I say, right. And, and that's, that's, inner, that's a very good inner leader moment. And you guys, and you, I think in one of the things I, I, your videos, you said, you know, I stood outside the men's world for a long time before I decided I will step in and I will take action, right? And that moment, that was an inner leader moment when you said this, when you began your hero's journey, you can see these are all inter intertwined here, uh, but it's a freely chosen response or action. Hey, we thank you for listening to the Winner Folsom podcast. Just a couple quick notes. First, if you are a man and you're looking for an honorable and inspiring group of men to hold you accountable and challenge you to grow in your relationships, your fitness, your career, your finances, and your life, go to www.k4men.com. And if you are a veteran, first responder, or man or woman who deals with trauma, and you are looking for some resiliency tools and skills for you, your team, your organization, go to valorresiliency.com. Back to the podcast. Um, the process of... of transitioning from the loud inner critic to that inner heroic voice of um, maturity, that's, that is an initiation process. Or, I mean, it can be akin to a some sort of a rite of passage into responsibility or ownership of our lives and the creation and, and the choice of our lives. And there's, there's always been a, a premise that we cannot self-initiate because it involves the death of an older operating system or old voice or way of being into a new one. And so obviously in your work, you know, you are um, the, the tribe or the support or the shaman who will take people across that threshold into a new way of being. Um, do you agree that pe people, particularly men need other men to go to conduct this transition? I actually don't think it probably takes place very well in men's work because I don't think most men's work have this model. I think they actually think the inner critic is probably right. You know, that there, there is too much like, you know, we got to be tougher. I mean, K4 is, is brilliant because we have love. We have the, you know, the lover archetype. Mm -hmm. But I don't think most, most people are very confused at the inner critic. That must be truth. That must be good. That must be right. You know? That's that's the default role of us, and we are, and we want to be good men, and so we aspire to these things, but but it's I think so I think there's a lot of confusion there. Um, is it martyrdom? It, it feels like shadow initiation is what I'm tracking. That's where I like the beating, like because there's different ways to initiate. You either break people in and push them over the edge and beat them down, which is inner critic talk. Essentially, you're repeating inner critic talk uh, and right. some of the harsh military units is a breakdown buildup process, right? The same thing I've seen in men's work. I've also seen it in military. I've seen it in um, a lot, athletic. A lot, lot of hazing you yeah. see on the videos of, you know, you've got to carry the log and it's sprayed by the hose, you know, to claim your manhood. And a lot right. of times people are talking that shit and beating you up and like trying to poke holes in your shame, like make you feel shameful. They're intentionally doing it versus <laughs> I think what, what we've done very openly is like, hey, you just got to do the hard work to 
face all your uncomfortable, messy shit. That is the initiation essentially is like in facing it, it takes, you're, you're not being pushed over or dragged over or humiliated over. Um, you're choosing to see and step over. It's a very different, it's an empowered sense. I'm just curious your take on it though, Scott. We're kind of yeah. unpacking this real time. Right. I guess I'm thinking a little bit more about the grails and the hero's journey, actually. Mm. Is where, it's more like if you, were to, if you were to live from your heart, if you were to live from those things inside of you, which seem most true in your heart, if you could find that in some way, what would they be? What would that life look like? And are you willing to do that? And we will walk with you on that journey through frightening, scary, uncomfortable things things together hmm. where you say i will approach the fear 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 i guess i think that's more where the game is um and it's, it's something like i but i have demon voice telling me i'm small telling me that's part of the battle some of the battles in the outside world some of the battles in the inside world but i guess i don't know, um i guess that's an initiation of sorts that going on that journey right but it's also not just about it's also about claiming a possible self it's claiming a story and a future for yourself. It's part of it for me, at least. I, I guess I, I am seeing a correlation, though, to what Philip's saying. Like, I'm just thinking of a direct experience. What, when Philip sees me differently than I see myself and three other guys see me that way, that inner critic doesn't have a lot of gas. Uh, it loses some of its power when Philip's like, oh, no, this is the man you are. Or other, other men are telling me and reinforcing that. But, I, but I'll also say, uh, it, just a kind of real quick small story. I had a buddy say I had a money story around a partner. Like, oh... I can't attract an actually healthy woman in my life until I make X number of dollars. And that was the inner critic. And then the inner critic would work hard and burn me out and it would replay these stories. Um, and uh, buddy was like, and I was like, I have a lot of really healthy women that are just friends. He's like, why don't you ask them? And so I asked them and they, the feedback there was like, oh, a sovereign woman doesn't need your money. A sovereign woman can make her own money and know she can help you 10 X your money. And she knows your emotional intelligence and awareness is 10x what most men with money actually have. And once they get a man with money, that's actually what they want. And so anyways, it was like it dissolved that story. So I, for me, yes, men has been my primary the last decade, but I'm also learning with healthy, I guess, sovereign or initiated or evolved women that are healthy leaders. That's also um, been helpful for me to destroy stories around the feminine, right? Because it's a woman. And hey, Josh, just to pile on all your women issues. <laughs> yeah, feel free, feel free, feel free. <laughs> Um, I think one of the things that um, why we need other men to carry us across this threshold is that because our inner critic is us, we can't see it. It's really hard to see it. You have a certain proclivity for a certain type of woman that you um, hung out with for a long time. And I, you didn't see the emotional and physical violence that was inherent in this repeated cycle. Mm -hmm. And, and, so I, I think that may be a, the initial part of, of other men is to provide a witness or a perspective or a illumination. And then the other part is how hard it is to transit, to actually have the accountability to put those new behaviors into place for long enough that they stick. Hard yeah, to develop I, something that sticks. Yeah, to, to give you credit, Philip said, you're not allowed to date these type of women anymore. Yeah, they were <laughs> fucking me up. Those women were fucking my life up. I didn't but, know it, that. but it shifted when he said that it raised the bar. And, and then I started thinking not just my own inner critic with relationship stories. It was more like, oh, can I bring this woman around my community? Can I bring it around to Philip's house? Can I? And it changed how I looked at things because it raised the standard by him challenging me in that way. I needed that push up against, which I think is what healthy men's containers do we push up against each other when we care about each other we hold each other accountable like you said you want a relationship this isn't getting you in that direction right so re really and, awesome. and so i'll own mind just uh, oftentimes you will kind of give me a nudge that if i am being activated and um i'm behaving a little bit um sharp and villainously mm -hmm. as i'm moving out of my victim and that so that you know those are the things that i don't see when i when i'm in my sadist place you know which it which is one of those inner critic triggers you know that's that's my dad mm -hmm. i mean there it was i i i'm very good at becoming my dad one thing what you're saying which i think is very valuable is that you know the men's community the men's group you know can be a counter to the inner critic an external voice 
was seeing us in a different way. And I think that's extremely valuable. We actually did one, my round table, we did a thing of seeing each other in, in positive ways that was very moving for us. But I, you don't have to do this, Joshua, but I would, I would say, from my perspective, I'd say, but if I were to go into you, I'd say, tell me the three or four great truths about who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, and let's go into that. Still, you know, I'm Joshua Winter. I am a man who's strong. I'm a man who's kind. I'm a man who's courageous. I'm a man who, uh, you know, is generous in spirit. You know, say that again. This is my truth. This is the man I bring to the world of women. This is my, this is who I am. I, I know my story. I claim this truth. And I go out into that world. Mm -hmm. That's the inner work that I, you know, and then, and that, that kind of man does not accept certain kinds of women. There's, there's a, a woman I know, she's kind of a conservative, she's a very provocative conservative woman. I know her a little bit. She says to me, she says, you can, you can tell the quality of a man by the women he sleeps with. <laughs> mm. um, you know, yeah. I think, wow, that's, that's strong. Mm -hmm. But like, you know, but you are a man of quality, you're a man of value and worth. And same thing for women, you know, the same, who am I? I don't, I don't settle for that. So that's the internal work. Um, so I think we, we put all these things together. You know, not just it's not one or the other, but that's the inner leader work. Is who am I? What's my story? Pearl Bailey, the the act, actor, said, uh, "A man without a story is not a man." So that's an amazing quote. I thought about that for many years. Mm. You know, who am I? Who's my story? So I would I would focus on that as, as well as the other stuff. But you want, you you have to create your core narrative, your core truth. And it has to be either be truth or be the truth that you want to be for you, right? Some of us feel like we're just a mess, but okay, I, I'm a mess now, but that's not the man I want to be. Yeah, and this is all, I, I've used a lot of other language. It didn't, it, it, I could see that, but the inner critic could override that. But for no, some no, reason, no, no, hearing- No, 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 no. But, no, but, but I'm just saying- Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. That's the work. We said, wait a minute, inner critic. You have to go to this chair. You don't get to override me. Mm -hmm. You don't, that's, that's, the game, that's the game we're playing at home. We're playing all the time in therapy. You don't get to override me. Yeah, but you're a fucking loser. Fuck you. I'm not a fucking loser. And I'm, I want this. And we go back and forth. And, and the inner critics, inner critics acting up right now. But this is my life. And this is the struggle. And that's why the inner leader, the ego is so important. Because we have to, this we have to strengthen against these, these forces. The other part says, well, this is too stressful. I just want to go, you know, do porn or have a drink or just zone out on, on, the, on YouTube for six hours. You know, like, no, I'm not doing that either. Because I am choosing my life. This is my life. And that's where the game and chair work is helpful because really we can space these things out rather than just having all in my brain, which is very difficult. You know, and I can put the chair four four feet away from me and say, inner critic, you, you are over there. I now have a spatial distance. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness in some ways is, is half the same thing. It's like I can observe things and not let them take over the system. Mm -hmm. So that's what chairs are so useful for. So I just wanted to sorry to interrupt you there, Josh, but I wanted to say we, we don't let the inner critic take over. We battle the inner critic. That's the game. I'm totally open. And Philip and I've actually talked about that a number of times where we get into this going like, no, let's like fuck that bullshit story is not allowed for it. But I, I think it's been a journey, at least where my current state is. For some reason, this is more recent where I just had those feedbacks and something shifted in my whole nervous system from like all of a sudden they were like, no, you're already a king in these areas where I was like the critic kept dismissing my qualities for the money. But for some reason, when I heard it differently, it shifted something. And now I've been able to hold that line. So, and I was just sharing that as now I'm feeling, and, and it's the irony is it's shifting how I look at everything just from one little different, powerful viewpoint. I'm like, Oh, I'm already there here. And I'm already better than 90% of men. It changed the whole way. It, I Cause Philip and I've been talking like the, the marathon versus the sprint. That story created me to focus on the sprint to try to make money, which was destroying me. Now right. I'm like, ah, I'm already there. Just slow growth on the on making money, right? So it's changed my narrative around right. that, which means I'm going to be around longer. Like big picture was, it was on the track to kill me. I mean, I was right. working that hard that it would have knocked me out. And like, now it's like, nope, you don't get to win anymore. <laughs> so this is, so I, I guess. So if I were, if I were yeah. to talk to you in a critic, we were actually doing therapy. Yep. You know, I said, said, move over and be your inner critic. And I would start being inner critic. I said, so, you know, what's the deal with the money? Why, why are you mm. on Josh so much about it? Right. Mm. And if it was more of an abusive critic, it might say something like, you know, Josh is fundamentally a worthless guy. No woman would ever want him, mm. you know, so he better get some money because he's just, you know, he's unlovable, right? Some nightmare story like that, right? That's an abusive mm. critic. The other one goes, 
I want him to be successful. I want him to find love. You know, it, it's important in this world that there's hypergamy, whatever it is. It's important in this world that, you know, men have money so they can take care of women and women are looking for providers. So he's got to get the money so he can get the love we want. Mm. That's a protector critic. And ah. there you can feel the difference mm. maybe between those two. Okay. And you as a leader go, first of all, I am lovable. So to the, the abusive one, you say, you're wrong. You know, and I, all these people love me. And the other one going, I get that you're frightened. I understand the fear. That's, that's not how I want to live my life. I don't think that's actually how the game works. But you are clouded by fear. That's why you're so focused on making money. Mm. But I will decide how much money I want to make and how I want to live life. So that's... Mm. Mm. Okay, okay, really, really cool distinction here. And this this uh, alludes to one of the questions that uh, one of the K4 men watching uh, had typed into the chat. And that was, um, there's a there's a positive output to the inner critic that it does drive us to something. There's a motivational piece in there of, and you could call it overcompensation or whatever it is, but it does drive men to get in shape to overcome adequacy, to make money, to, you know, to, so you don't get abandoned or there are some, there are some outputs to that. And was that what you just referred to a minute no. ago? Okay. Well, well, in a way, but the issue, so that issue comes up a lot. This like, the, but the inner critic motivates me, right? Let's, let's mm. take that out for a second. So first of all, when you live your life that way, you basically have a parent child dynamic in your mind. Where the parents yelling at the child to do something, the child saying, okay, I'll do this. And you have this, you're not living authentically. Authentically says, I am going to, you know, train for this marathon because I want to do this. It's important to me to do this, right? Now, again, you know, the inner leader and the, and the critic can work together as a team. That's, more, that's the healing in some ways. How do we do this together? But it, it's um, also at the end of the day, the inner critic is not strong enough to help you be successful. Right. One thing we don't do things because we, we can't do great things out of a should. And men, men in K4 want to do great things. It's never going to happen because of a should. And the other thing is, which is interesting, I like to have this conversation. The critic actually does not know how to do anything because the critic is not a person. The critic has never been on a date. The critic has never held a job. The critic has never done a podcast. The critic has never made any money. The critic has no actual lived experience. And I often challenge the critics, you know, authority by saying you've never done any of these things. You've never cooked an omelet. You know, you don't Scott, know you can't see these guys, but there are men taking notes right now. <laughs> I can see everybody's heads are down and I can see frantic scribbling because you're dropping bombs right now. <laughs> and everybody listening, I'm sure, is pausing I, 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 this podcast. I, I'm and, and I'm squirming, bro, right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. my inner critic has never done anything. Boy, my, th and that might be one of the reasons why I'm fucking struggling with shit, because I'm using him as my, you know, that's my nuclear engine. Right. Mm. Of my entire my life is that. Right. Mm. Keep yeah. going. Now, now the inner, the way inner, when a healthy inner critic, not an abusive one, a healthy inner critic can help us was inner critic to say we can work together to set goals, we can work together to, to maybe to create a plan of action, right. The inner critic that's more, more uh, defensive can watch, can say, this guy feels dangerous to me. I don't think we should be friends with this guy. Or I don't think this is a good guy for, to, to do you know, some sort of partnership with. Or, you know, or inner critic says, you know, you're going on this date, maybe, maybe we should dress a little bit better. The we is a, we is a good term. We're a team. You know, maybe, maybe that shirt is looking a little ratty. Let's get another shirt. You know, that's when you can work as a team together to move the game forward, move the person forward. But um, the inner critic is uh, it's such a difficult thing for all of us. And I'm, you know, I, by no means have gotten this under control. I mean, I'm, I wrestle with it every day, but. Um, I, I really do love this conversation because that's, that is one thing I do find helpful is if, it, if it, we can't kill it, we can't get away from it, but we can give it a new role. And, and it's almost like the, the inner hero can start to go to the inner critic and say, hey, I love you. You've protected me. For a long time, you kept me alive when I was a child and I wasn't safe and you've been a server, but you're not serving me anymore. Right. And so let's give you a role where you can help us now. Like right. you, like, let's give you a role where you're super online. We need you. We're going to you. And you can, you can be seen by us regularly as a value add versus a value stop. And I find that there was a guy, uh, actually a K4 guy. He had heavy anxiety that we worked with. 
And he went into dialogue with the anxiety and realized like the anxiety was just trying to protect him from these heavy emotions when he felt sad. And then he said, well, I'm an adult now. Can I give you a, a new role? Like instead of giving me anxiousness that would force him to isolate and get busy and take on all these projects, it's like, can you just tell me when I'm sad and I can go regulate my nervous system and go feel the sadness now that I know how to do that? And it literally, it, it, was, it was a one-time thing and it shifted him and all of a sudden he's able to start feeling. And he's like, oh, I just get sad, stop and start crying. And then I was good again. And there was no, it changed the whole pattern because the that part, it doesn't work with everybody, but that part linked up really quick. So it's a, it's summarizing, giving it a new role and loving it and and just saying, Hey, you're with me. You're integrating you. Well, I, yeah, I often give it the role of advisor actually is a role I often think about as a good role for that part. Hmm. So the, the inner critic um, is built to survive. Well, there are two right. inner critics. Well, one is built to survive and one is built to destroy. So you have to well, be careful which one we're talking about. I, what, I, I'm, what I'm kind of getting playing with an analogy here is we can ride our inner critic to survive, um, but we need to go to the inner hero to thrive, to mm -hmm. actually win. To actually well, win, you need to get into that, that inner hero mode, which is creative and generative and actually is built to do shit. Yeah. So one, th one thing, just to make a point here, and Freud made this point originally about the superego, the inner critic is not rational. I talk to inner critics all day long, and the rules that they have, the things that they think are important, usually come out of some sort of traumatic experience, as Josh was talking about before. So it's not like they're reading the world and have a kind of a, you know, a wise approach to it. You know, I mean, I remember, you know, the inner critics have all kinds of things that they're they're worried about, which may or may not be what adults should be focusing on. You know, the, the, the opinions of other people matter. It's like life or death that everybody likes me. That's not how you live an adult life, but that's how they're running. That's how they want to run the system. Hmm. You know, and they get very, and you feel anxiety about all these things because they're like, these are rules to live by. So you may not even, you may not even survive with your inner critic because it, it doesn't, it's, it's based in trauma. Hmm. It's based in, in something, something went wrong. You know, you know, uh, people who are perfectionistic can often not, not get their work done. And they uh, they lose jobs because they can't. The standards are too high because if you lower your standards, something bad will happen. That's not adaptive. Mm. But um, but to grow, you certainly need more inner leader. That's I would definitely you're 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 on the right track. You know, of um, that's where we thrive and do creative things or do heroic things. Um, it, it's just not enough to be yelled at to become a great a great person. I don't think uh, so. so so, hey, Scott, I know we're, I mean, we could, this is such a juicy topic. We may bring you back again because it's a sledgehammer. There was multiple sledgehammer moments in here that we may want to come back and revisit, but I'd say I got a whole page full of notes too. Um, so question though, if we usually give a challenge to our listeners, so somebody's listening or the K4 men that are on right now, what's a challenge that would be helpful? Like how can they take this conversation and implement some, is it to become aware of their inner critic to start to notice the next time of that? you know, awareness is a function of choice. Could they bring some awareness to that? Or what would you recommend as, a, as an action item for them? Well, I thought, I've been thinking about something lately. I thought I might give you a little exercise to try here. If that's okay. So I need one of you to, one of you to volunteer for a second. Josh. Josh is volunteer. Okay. <laughs> so, so Josh, tell me three, three positive qualities about you or that you are striving to live in your life honor integrity and um compassionate and just to just to clarify for myself the difference between honor and integrity is what for you or are they sort of the same thing it's i guess it, that's pretty close to the same thing yeah so let's say honor honor compassion and service uh, honor compassion growth i'm always going to grow um, I'm going to be compa mainly compassionate with self. I've been compassionate with others for a long time. I'm learning to be compassionate with self right. um, and um, honor. So, so three values that you you hold as important for yourself are honor, compassion, and growth. Would that be fair to say? Correct. Okay. So I'm just going to give you some language and just re repeat this, if you would. Yep. Okay. I'm going to do it a couple of different ways. All right. Mm -hmm. um, you call yourself Josh. You call yourself Joshua. Joshua. Okay, so say this. 
I am Joshua Winner. I'm Joshua Winner. I am a man of honor. I am a man of honor. I am a man of compassion. I am a man of compassion. And I am a man who seeks to grow. And I am a man who seeks to grow. I want to say all of that again. I am Joshua Winner. I am Joshua Winner. I am a man of honor. I am a man of honor. I am a man of compassion. I am a man of compassion. I am a man who's seeking to grow. And I am a man who's seeking to grow. Say that in your own words one time. I am Joshua Winner. I am a man of honor. I am a compassionate man. And I am a man who seeks for growth. Right. That is, move yourself like a micro inch. Let's do something in your chair. Okay, good. Now you're going to say it second person. Joshua, this is what I see in you. Joshua, this is what I see in you. I see that you are a man of honor. I see that you are a man of honor. I see that you are a man of compassion. I see that you are a man of compassion. And I see that you are a man dedicated to your growth. And I see that you are a man dedicated to your growth. Let's say that again. Joshua, I'm looking at you and this is what I see. Joshua, I'm looking at you and this is what I see. I see that you are a man of honor. I see that you are a man of honor. I see that you are a man of compassion. I see that you are a man of compassion. And you are a man dedicated to growing. And you are a man dedicated to growing. You say that on your own once. Uh, Joshua, this is what I see of you, see in you. I see that you are a man of honor. I see that you are a compassionate man. And I see that you're a man committed to growth. Okay. And move yourself one more micro inch. Okay. I want to tell you something about Joshua Winner. I want to tell you something about Joshua Winner. Joshua is a man of honor. Joshua is a man of honor. Joshua is a man of compassion. Joshua is a man of compassion. Joshua is a man dedicated to, to growing. Joshua is a man dedicated to growing. So say it again. I, I want to tell you, something about, I want to tell you something about Joshua Winner. I want to tell you something about Joshua Winner. He is a man of honor. He is a man of honor. He is a man of great compassion. He is a man of great compassion. And he is a man dedicated to growth. And he is a man dedicated to growth. And you say it once yourself. I want to tell you something about Joshua Winner. He is a man of honor. He is a man dedicated. He's a man of compassion. And he's a man dedicated to growth. How are you feeling inside? You're saying that. Good. All right. Yeah. So Good. first first person, second person, third person. I saw that. Yeah. Saying positive things about yourself. Three or four things. Mm -hmm. Ah. So I thought that would be that's strengthening the inner leader. So a little a little practice if that I thought that would be helpful Great. for the, the group. Great. So so everybody listening, this is your challenge. Pick three things. Um, say it from these three different perspectives, just like how we modeled. Um, how often should they do that? Twice a day. That would be great. Twice a day, and that'll start to strengthen that inner, inner leader of them. And maybe pick different qualities. Do the same three for a week, and then change it up for the next week, and keep picking right. different qualities. And if and if you for some reason feel like you don't have any good qualities in you, maybe you're in some some dark place. Then what are the qualities that you want to be? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to be a man of honor. I want to be a man of compassion. I want to be a man who's dedicated to growth. Right. So that's another way to do that. If you feel you're not there yet. Mm -hmm. So good, hey Scott. Um, before we get off. Where can people find, like, are you doing other workshops, like transformational chair workshops? Are you doing, you know, can people get a hold of you? Like, how do they find you, get a hold of you, learn more about you? Any programs you have coming up? Anything you want to share? Yeah, so we actually we actually have a new website. Um, so it's, we've been developing a new company. Uh, it's called Chairwork Psychotherapy Initiative. And if you look up uh, chairworktherapy.com, you, you should find it there. We'll put it, I guess you'll post it down in the below but um it's been a great pleasure to be here thank you so much for having me here great to be with my k4 brothers thank you for the, the, the generous comments there mm. and it was great fun and uh yeah i think you were getting what i'm doing about with the inner inner critic and great to interweave it with what you're doing so you're a hero you're a hero scott mm -hmm. thank, you. Mm. thank you powerful so good thank you brother this was such a good call so fun yep Hey, thanks everybody for listening and stay battle tested, folks. See you out there.